basic scientist. Uh, my first meeting, I believe, was in 1989. Phil Hanawalt invited me to uh, present a talk in a session that he was chairing at the EMGS, and I believe it was in Toronto, actually. Uh, this is a sunset uh, kind of close to my house in Arizona. So I'm going to talk about stress-induced mutagenesis from SOS to the DNA damage response. Maybe I should change it to Phil's thing, but right now we'll talk about the DNA damage response. So first I'm going to give this SOS aficionado test because I was told that a number of interesting people would be in the audience. <laughs> All right. One irradiates a plate of E. coli bacteria with UV light and looks at them under the microscope. And you can either see no filamentation or filamentation. What's wrong with this picture? Come on, you guys know. Wake up. What's wrong with the picture? Toxicity in the resistance frame. Right. It, it, it switched, right? So, so what was shown is if it's resistant, it doesn't. The BBRR strain, identified by Witkin in 1946, doesn't filament. But E. coli B, which is UV sensitive, Filaments. And this actually played a key role in uh, uh, thinking about the SOS response to DNA damage. This is a really cool picture of Evelyn in about 47, 48. I love it. Okay. The amazing history of SOS. Bible reactivation came into the thinking and the play here. In, and it was, just, it was published in 1953 <laughs> by Bible. So here you're UV irradiating phage. And if you plate those phage on an E. coli host, not many of them survive, and we look at survival by plaques, right? A, a lot of young people in the audience today have never done this, I think. Oh, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, if you plate a uh, UV irradiated phage on a UV irradiated host, however, you get a lot of plaques, so a lot of phage survive, and it was subsequently shown that a lot of these phage have mutations. So there's something going on here, some sort of a response going on in the cells that's allowing this to happen, that's rescuing these phage. Now, uh, Lwoff showed in about 1950, he demonstrated that prophage were induced in response to treatment of the cells, the bacterial cells with UV light. And again, you can see the prophage induction uh, because of the uh, uh, plaque form on the plate. So Evelyn asked uh, in 1967, what do these processes have in common? Filamentation and prophage induction. And she very clearly outlined this interestingly in a PNAS paper communicated by her dear friend Barbara McClintock that they both occur in response to low doses of UV light and other agents that, agents that damage DNA. They're photoreversible if UV light is the damaging agent. They depend on the presence of DNA damage, but at very low levels, the damages can occur anywhere in the DNA. It, the, these uh, phenomena do not occur if protein synthesis is blocked, so we need protein. Treatment with caffeine, who's drinking coffee, inhibits DNA repair, leads to more of, of each of these things, filamentation and, and uh, uh, prophage induction. And if damage remains in the DNA, more of each occurs, suggests replication blockage. So she goes on to suggest that the repression of an operon induces prophage induction. This must also be the case for filamentation, hence an inducible stress response. And this is Evelyn uh, in her lab at Rutgers looking under the microscope. This is Owen McCall and Howard Lieberman. She loved to look at snakes. She used to call them snakes. And every once in a while, we'd gather around the microscope and, and look at the snakes. And uh, this is yours truly with Evelyn back when I was a graduate student. <laughs> now, Miro Radman, uh, who's also uh, plays an incredibly important role in the SOS response. Miro and I were both credited with it, of course. He privately circulated this memo on SOS replication in 1970. This is his memo. And at that point, we knew about Ruben Howard Flanders, where we had daughter strand gaps that were across from the UV damage. Um, what Miro proposed was that those gaps were filled and this was highly efficient repair. This is SOS replication. 
extensive mutagenesis. This is translucent synthesis, right? This is what Miro proposed. Brent Bridges subsequently published a review, which I've not cited. I'm sorry about that. And he says that the SOS replication hypothesis was published in this obscure book. Radman published in 74, Phenomenology of an Inducible Mutagenic DNA Repair Pathway in E. coli SOS Repair Hypothesis. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? But it, it was published in this obscure book, according to Bridges. And then in 1975, Hannibal and Setlow had another book where Miro published this again. I guess it's not an obscure book. I guess this is the non-obscure and this is the obscure book. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Uh, now, Miro, I looked for a picture of Miro, and you can buy them. <laughs> so if anyone would like to purchase, this is a plug for this, Miro, the picture of Miro, you can purchase them. There are several of them. They're very nice. They're incredibly interesting. <laughs> this is my favorite picture, of course, Miro and Evelyn in Paris in 2012. All right. Additional significant contributions. I didn't want to eliminate anybody, but I had to. But there are several significant contributions. A lot of SOS genes were identified by Kenyon and Graham Walker. The uvimutagenesis mutagenesis locus, UMU, was identified. UMU goes on to turn out to be a, a polymerase uh, by a number of different people. SOS mutagenesis requires UMUD, cleavage of UMUD to UMUD prime, the SOS polymerase. Uh, and Reke has a direct role in SOS mutagenesis. I think perhaps the best paper on that is the Dutrex uh, paper with, uh, again, a dear friend, uh, Raymond Deveray. So here's Graham, a dear friend, and Raymond. Raymond, of course, uh, passed away earlier this year. And I like this picture. It's, it doesn't have a lot of colors, and it's not animated. It's Graham's picture. And, I really like it. This is the SOS induction of the SOS response. We have DNA damage that generates replication blocks, single-stranded DNA. Uh, Reke uh, forms on that DNA uh, a filament. It might not be. If there used to be arguments about whether it was a filament or not. I'm afraid to talk about filaments, actually. I was traumatized in early Gordon conference. Uh, but, so this is Reke activated. Uh, Reke activate facili Reke activated facilitates Cleavage of uh, the Lexa uh, uh, repressor. Once that repressor is cleaved, all of these SOS genes are induced and, and proteins are produced. So, this is the SOS polymerase, REC A, et cetera. Uh, it also facilitates uh, cleavage of the UMU uh, D uh, polymerase to UMU D prime, which is actually the polymerase. But we didn't know it at this time. Uh, Pat Jekylls and Myron Goodman come into play here where they're generating, they did, they did generate a mechanistic understanding of SOS mutagenesis. And here I have a picture of Myron with his EMGS badge when he won the EMGS award. Hatch, of course, uh, died way too early. Uh, but both of them are giants who made incredible contributions to the field. So here we have Paul 5, which is UMUD uh, prime. Uh, and when it engages, when it's when when Rec A uh, donates uh, one molecule of Rec A T to the UMUD prime and ATP binds, we now have an activated Paul 5 mute polymerase, the translesion polymerase, which can go past the damage. ATP hydrolysis then dissociates and deactivates that polymerase, and so that's SOS mutagenesis originally proposed uh, by Wittgen and Radman. Now we come to the DNA damage response. Elledge, after he left uh, uh, Graham's lab, uh, <coughs> with, went to Mark Davis's lab and was looking for the Rec A eukaryotes using a specific antibody and instead found rapidly tigerductase 2. I guess the antibodies weren't that great back then. But Steve didn't give up on it, and he continued to study it and showed that it was induced in response to DNA damage, actually replication stress and decided that cells must be able to sense replication stress and activate uh, ribonucleotide reductase. That was in 87. So this is a different paradigm that Leona showed us with a methylatinine DNA glycosylase. It's induced in response to alkylating agents in yeast, but she showed that its present results, presence results in increased mutations. Different. And it's, at, and it's absence in decreased mutations. And she went on to propose toxic intermediates for, and the need for balance of enzymes during the ER. So this is a paradigm shift, in my opinion. Um, and many, many more contributions that I, I can't really, uh, I don't have time to talk about. Later on, uh, 
uh, Elledge goes on to show that the DUN1 is a protein kinase that's autophosphorylated, and that eukaryotes have SOS response responses that, that are regulated by protein phosphorylation. So now we're not talking about transcription anymore, we're talking about post-translational modification. 10 years later, RAT53 is the discovered as the protein kinase acting upstream of DUN1. Therefore, pro protein phosphorylation cascade mediates the DNA damage response. And then Kasten and Fornas et al., a lot of famous people on this paper, show that patients with ataxia telling dactasia don't induce P53 after treatment with ionizing radiation. So now the DNA damage response is linked to a disease. DNA damage response defects in cancer predisposition because it's cancer predisposition syndrome. And then there are many, others, many other examples of DNA damage sensors and links to cancer. Now illustrations are getting, not only is the system more complicated, but illustrations are getting fancier. <laughs> Look at that. Woo. So that's the DNA damage response as of 2007, and a lot is going on there. So I just thought I would summarize it quickly. The Trinity. We have a double. We have double, This is about double strand breaks here, but we have to remember, as Phil pointed out, there's lots of different types of damage, right? But we have DNA PKCS, ATM, and ATR, and and of course these are the downstream effects. Lots of them, not just DNA repair. At one point, the DNA damage response, you know, as all this was going on, uh, Lee Hartwell and Ted Weiner, Ted Weiner is one of my colleagues, you know, uh, discovered the RAD9 gene and, and the fact that cell cycle was halted. Uh, and a lot of people thought that the DNA damage response was only about cell cycle control, but that really wasn't true. And all these other things, senescence, apoptosis, RNA metabolism, et cetera, are effects. And as, as Phil mentioned, this phase separation now is really incredible, where the, the chromatin domains and phase separation, where proteins can be recruited to repair DNA, et cetera, is, is, is an emerging topic. So the next 50 years. I think, you know, it's moving beyond model organisms. Apparent, apparent DNA, and I have nothing against model organisms. Don't take that. I love model organisms. But, Aberrant DNA damage responses result in human diseases other than cancer, in order to generation. I'm thinking about autoimmunity, as are many others in the room. The roles of the environment uh, on the DNA damage response and epigenetic processes, human population-based studies. Many of my, our, our colleagues are doing these human population studies. These are going to be incredibly important if we think about precision medicine for all, for example. Targeting of DNA damage response pathways for the treatment of cancer and other diseases. So beyond DNA repair, some of the questions that, that I've been thinking about are under which circumstances are base modifications DNA damage versus DNA modifications to facilitate downstream events. We'll have speakers uh, here to, in this meeting to talk about this. Uh, adox or gene inflammatory responses, for example. Uh, have specific types of DNA damage evolved to converse with the immune system or vice versa? Uh, well, then yesterday talked about the innate immunity and CGAF sting. Does DNA damage response function to promote cancer cell stemness? This is a fascinating paper. Uh, just this year in Molecular Cell, where the DNA damage response was shown to induce transcription of OCT4 and uh, uh, convert cells into cancer stem cells. Fascinating. And then back to E. coli, you know, a couple of years ago, this came out. So, nutritional stresses. Just simple things, nitrogen, iron, oxygen, basic things. These stresses <coughs> induce mutagenesis, but each stress generates a unique set of mutations. Now, we've known this for some time, but if we actually think about nutritional stress, that's a really big topic in terms of the population, the human population. <coughs> Future challenge for me, uh, since I'm a basic scientist, is the support for basic research to provide fundamental mechanistic insights into the underlying responses of cells and organisms to environmental stresses, <coughs> and to support the next generations of amazing scientists, and to facilitate discoveries that will cure human diseases. So that's a major challenge. My particular challenge is organizing <laughs> the MGS meeting. And uh, it's going to be a fabulous meeting, all right? We're, we have environmental genomics, mechanisms and approaches for genomic integrity, 
some incredible symposia. And look at these, these keynote speakers, Mary Claire King, Joan Stites, Troy Eidegger, and Carrie Stephenson. More to come. Thanks. Yeah, yeah.